maybe Al, you can just start by giving me a you know, background of you. I've read that you were a mediocre sales rep for 22 years. I was. <laughs> <laughs> Would you mind elaborating on that and yeah, how you I was, were introduced to Sandler? Yeah, I was a corporate sales guy for uh, 24 years total. My first job out of college was selling cash registers for NCR. Awesome. And, and and they had sales training. They, you know, they sent us to Dayton, Ohio, and did what, what they called sugar camp up there. And you know, but it was mostly product training. It was a little bit of sales training, sales skills, but mostly product training. And then most of my sales career was selling technology, and most of that time primarily to banks. So high tech to banks was really my world. But it was really all just order taking. You know, I happened to be in the right place, right time. Phone was ringing, and you know, so I was putting up numbers, which was the worst thing that could have happened because it made me think I was good at sales. Correct. Because I was putting up numbers, but I wasn't good. You know, I really wasn't very good. I was just answering the stupid phone, what I was doing. <laughs> and it wasn't until 1999 when I sat in a Sandler session, probably much like you did, where I, I realized, hey, look, I, I'm a fraud. You know, I'm in my mid-40s at the time. I'm going, I am a fraud. I am not a professional salesperson, As even though I've been are. selling for 22 years. Yeah. And so, you know, and then two years later, I bought a Sandler franchise. <laughs> wow. That was easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Saw well, the so, light. Yeah. And you've been so, doing that for about 18 years, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. We're getting right close, man, on the end of our 19th year. Yeah. Wow, yeah. that's awesome. So, what's your favorite Sandler rule? Well, I there's probably some, many. I know. <laughs> Let's just. Yeah. But number cool. 14 is one that I'd like to talk about today. Yeah. You know, prospect who is listening is no prospect at all. And that's just a terrific mindset to have in terms of how you run a sales call. You know, most salespeople talk too much, right? They, you know, in that's fact, the, the joke is, hey, you know, Al's got the gift of gab. He should go into sales, right? That's the joke. Show but it, up but, and throw up. Yes. But, but most people who don't, don't understand professional sales actually don't think it's a joke. They think that's the way salespeople are. The people that talk a lot should be in sales. And then like I had a boss, my, one of my first bosses in my sales career has told, told me that my job was to educate the prospect. You know, so it stuck in my mind that I've got to start educating the prospect from hello, you know, shake the hand and then start <laughs> educating them. Or certainly, you know, most of us in sales feel like we need to show off our expertise, right? Our knowledge. We need to show that we know what we're doing. We don't want to look like we're you know, a newbie and not really know what we're doing. So all that stuff tends to contribute to salespeople talking too much. Now, let me say this. There's nothing wrong with salespeople talking, right? but you got to know when to say what, you know, when in the sales cycle, does it make sense to be talking about your stuff, you know, your knowledge, your expertise, your solutions. And, and of course in Sandler, you know, we, we train our clients to, to in the initial parts of the sales cycle to be getting most of the information coming your way from the prospect. You know, in, in fact, we have a rule for that. We call it the 70-30 rule, you know, where the right. prospect should be talking about two-thirds, 70% of the time in the initial conversations so that you get, so you're in, and your 30% is mostly questions, right? You're asking them, you know, what is their situation today? Where do they wish it would be? You know, how does that affect them personally? And, you know, we, we call that stuff pain, right? right? So we want to know their pain and we want to know you know, what their budget situation is. Is this project or initiative, is it funded or can, be, can it be funded? And at, at what level? Uh, and then we want to know how do they go about making these kinds of decisions? You know, the who, what, when, where, why, how of their decision process. And so all that information has got to come our way from the prospect to us in the initial conversations. Then once we know all about them, you know, all about their situation, what they're trying to accomplish, the roadblocks in their way, you know, how to, you know, their frustrations, their, you know, their emotions, their worry, their concerns. Once we understand all that and their, and their budgeting considerations and their decision-making process, then we can take our knowledge and expertise and turn that 70-30 rule around so right. that now we're doing most of the talking. But that part then is that we're, the, what, what talking we're doing is to help apply our knowledge, our expertise, our, our, the features and benefits of our, not, of our solution to their pain. So that it's, you know, square peg, square hole, right? Round right. peg, round hole. We're nailing it. And they right. see us as the pain relief to their pain. Right. Uh, so, I think many sales reps still haven't figured that out. And I yeah. happen to be listening to those demos and yeah. I'm just like, you haven't asked me a single question. We're about 29 minutes into this. That's it. And we have a 30 you know, minute call. So how is this going to work? I went into an electronic store one time to buy a television. 
because a storm had fried one of our TVs. And I hadn't bought a television in years. And the technology had, you know, passed me by, right? Right. <laughs> and, and so I went in there. And, of course, the guy walks up and says, you know, can I help you? And I said, you know, I gave him the story. Hey, you know, fried television, got to buy a new one. But don't know much about the technology. And you could just see the lights go on in his eyes, right? He's like, okay, I get to talk. Right. And for 30 minutes, no joke, for 30 minutes straight, he talked about television technology. Now, Solomon, while this was going on, I was facing the front door and I could see that two people came in the door, walked over to the television section. He was the only sales rep on that section of the floor. So they had to wait for him to disengage with me, which he wasn't about to do. And they both walked right back out the door. And I saw that going on while he was talking for 30 minutes. And it's just like you said, he didn't ask me one word, not one word about, or not one question about, you know, what do I like to watch? Right. And what's the room like? What about sound? Who else watches with me? What are they like? None of those really basic questions, right? I mean, just he just all he did was just, as you said, show up and throw up, and just he just unloaded his expertise on me for thirty minutes. When he finally took a breath and asked me what I thought, I said, "You know what? This is terrific stuff. You have been so helpful, but I can't go back home to my wife and tell her I bought a TV at the first place I went to." So I'm going to go down the street. I said, but don't worry. I'll be back because you're top of my list. You have been so helpful. Now, he, he did you know, a great he, job. Yeah, he, exactly. He thought he had done his thing, right? He probably went home that day and told his wife how wonderful he was. But of course, you know, the other Santa rule that applies here, which is all prospects lie all the time. That's and, right. and I had no intention of coming back to his store. I went, to, I went down the street to another store, saw what I needed in, in, in that second store that I had already picked out in my mind in the first guy's store. It was 50 bucks less in the second store. I already knew I wanted it. So I bought it on the spot, right? And then out in five minutes, never went back to the first store. You know, it's interesting. I tell that story to people and they feel sorry for the first salesperson. They don't even understand the concept that the guy just unloaded expertise on me from hello right. and didn't really make the effort to find out what I was thinking, what I was wanting, what my pain was. Yeah, it's very true. And they sometimes we call that like techno babble in our space in the tech space. And you feel like yeah. throwing big words at them, SEO, pay-per-click and, <laughs> and, and oh, man, prospects, I get so that. <laughs> yeah, prospects have no idea. They just need yeah. help, right? Like, you know, we're yeah. in the marketing space. They just need leads. Just help me get generate more leads. Instead of speaking to them, what type of leads or how do you, you know, how do you qualify a lead or what's a qualified lead to you? We're just throwing, you know, Google's algorithm at them. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. That's exactly right. So a second favorite rule, perhaps? Well, that one I just said, all prospects lie all Got the time it. is a Got good it. one. You know what? There, you know, we have the official 49 Santa rules, but there's so many, so many more than even those 49. And I like one that came from David Sandler himself back in the day that didn't make the uh, list of 49. But yeah, the book. But it, it's never tell a prospect what you can ask them instead. I never awesome. tell a prospect what you can ask them instead. So you know, which, which you know, if you, there's awful kinds of ramifications there, right? But, you know, most people like, like, let's say that uh, a television salesperson walked into my den, right? And saw my new TV and would say to me, well, you know, and, hey, you bought the plasma 70 inch, well, it's not 70, it's 59, I think. You, know, you bought this stuff, you know, you know, where'd you buy it? Well, you probably should have done this and done that instead, blah, 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 right? Instead of saying to me, interesting choice of television. Can you help me understand why you decided to, to purchase that one? Right, that would be asking me what they wanted to tell me. So in other words, the, the, whole, the whole psychology behind that is that prospects don't argue with their own data. Right. You know, when a salesperson tells them stuff, they tend to discount what the salesperson is saying because you know, the paradigm of salesperson is that they lie, that, you know, that they embellish you know, right. that bait and switch, that, that they overpromise, underdeliver. under deliver. So prospects are programmed not to take what a salesperson says at face value. But if the sales professional can get the prospect to fully describe their situation by asking questions, the prospect never disputes what they themselves say. So Very now true. you've got facts to deal with, right? You've got real information to deal with as a sales professional. And then you can, you, then you can go from there. Right. You become a trusted advisor easier than just telling them exactly what to do. And nobody wants to hear that. Yeah. So maybe it's uh, having the prospects build their candy instead. Yes. But of course, you know, as you probably know, most salespeople, they, what they worry about 
if they ask questions in the beginning stages instead of telling stuff, what they worry about is that they'll look you know, foolish to the prospect or look like they don't know what they're doing, you know, look like they're a newbie. What they usually realize later, if they go ahead and follow our advice and dig in and get a good questioning strategy going in their sales calls, what they realize is that by the way they phrase their questions, the prospect never thinks that they're a newbie and don't know what they're talking about. And by the way, you phrase your questions. Here's an example. Uh, one of my prospects asked me one time, he said, uh, does your sales training curriculum include training on prospecting? Well, Solomon, I could talk for hours on our curriculum on prospecting, right? And that would be violating the rule 14, right? right. A prospect who is listening is no prospect at all. If I went on and on and on about prospecting, Besides, I might even miss the boat, That's right? True. So I said to him, I said, interesting question about prospecting. What I find is that some people, when they ask that question, they want to know what are the best ways to get new prospects. Others ask that question because their sales team members just don't do prospecting and they want to know how do I get these people to do it? Right. And I said, which camp are you in? Okay, so that's what we call uh, a menu question, right? We give him two choices and ask him to choose one. And he said, well, you know, my guys, they know how to prospect. They know where to prospect. They just don't do it. How do I get them to do it? Now, I wouldn't have assumed that that was the choice he would have made if I hadn't asked him the question. I would have, have assumed that he wanted to know the best ways to prospect. And I would have spent 20, 30 minutes on that topic. And he would have come away from that conversation thinking that I didn't really understand what he was looking for. And I wouldn't have won that deal. So I was able then, as soon as he answered my question and said it was this one over here where they don't actually prospect, they don't want to, that's a whole different issue. So we were able to focus on that issue and I was able to win that business. Right. Instead of giving him the whole curriculum. Yeah. Chapter by chapter. Yeah. Which I would have loved to do because I love our stuff. Right. Zin? That was the original, yeah. Al. Nothing new, Al. Yeah, that's right. But to tell you what, that old programming is so strong. I still hear my boss telling me my job is to educate the prospect. Wow. And I hear it from my prospects and, and clients. My mm -hmm. clients tell me, they say, Al, we're different. Our industry is different. We have to educate the prospect. We have to show them how we're different. And so I just use my own dog food, right? I just say, well, help me understand why you say that. And I ask them a few more questions. And then pretty soon they come around to realizing you know what? There's plenty of time to educate them after we know their pain. Let's find out their pain. That's a great question. Yeah. Favorite books you can share with us, Al? I know you have probably a oh, big yeah. library. Oh, yeah. My favorite book for sales professionals is called The Contrarian Salesperson, written by Sandler Trainer and Jody Williamson out of Chicago. Terrific book, The Contrarian. It's easy to read. It's like a parable or a story awesome. called The Contrarian Salesperson. It's a really good one. For sales managers, Another great book is called The Intentional Sales Manager, written by another center trainer, Pat McManaman, out of Jacksonville, Florida. Terrific book for sales management. So, yeah. And for VPs of sales, maybe The Success Cadence, yep. uh, written by three different authors, including David Matson, the CEO of Center Training. So, yeah, those are three great books. But for sales professionals who might be listening today, I think the, the uh, you know, The Contrarian salesperson, which is a great title, right? It's the it one is. who doesn't do what everybody else does. And many times in life, we have to be the contrarian, anything, right? For us to stick yeah. out and stand out and get what we need. Because most of the time going with the flow doesn't get you anywhere. Well, you know, there's a saying there, which is another saying the rule, by the way, which is if you look, act and sound like just another salesperson, you're going to be treated like one. Yep. And we spend a lot of time with our clients on that one because most people don't know how not to look like a salesperson. It's true. And, true. Uh, and of course, prospects treat salespeople like, you know, the uh, lowest form of earth, <laughs> earth matter, right? I mean, yeah. And I know it's the highest form of profession, in my opinion, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's the highest paying profession in the world. That's right. So, per person. So, yeah. Awesome. Any yeah. final thoughts? Any common mistakes you see entry level sales reps make that they can? hopefully fixed today by just watching or listening to this with Al. Yeah, you know, I think one of the biggest things that most people don't even think about is just to relax. You know, just relax, breathe, slow everything down. You know, when a prospect asks you a question, you don't have to answer right away. You don't have to, and if you, especially if you feel pressure you know, to get the answer to their question correctly or to you know, help it have your answer, help your cause. Just relax, slow everything down, breathe 
consider what's behind the question and ask the prospect, hey, you know, there must be a reason why you asked me that particular question. You mind if I ask you what, you know, what your context is behind that before I answer? And that, by the way, helps to kick in the 70-30 rule. You know, phrases like, you know, help me understand or you know, could you walk me through your current process? And those are great phrases to use to get the prospect used to talking, doing more of the talking in the first stages of the uh, sales cycle. And then the salesperson then has plenty of time to think and consider um, before they respond. There's a so, reason yeah. why we have two years and one month, right? Huh? Nah, it can't be. <laughs> can't be a reason for that at all. <laughs> yeah. So that's awesome. Thank you so much yeah. for joining me today. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you having me on, Solomon. I love talking about this stuff, and I hope it helps your uh, your listeners. Thank you so much. 